Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins. The Institute is a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. The Fall 2014 Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. An extremely distinguished paleoanthropologist working in Ethiopia. I'm sure some of you have heard him speak before uh, and on lots of things. And his interest in uh, not just bones, but tools and ecology, what were our ancestors doing, that sort of thing. Questions like those uh, have driven him to an interest uh, in food as well and the evolution of how that happens, what, what makes us what we are. So I'll give you Scott. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to come speak with this group uh, because what it does is it forces me to move my research into new directions and be able to explain it carefully, not only to others, but also to myself to make sense of this. And also what it does is it pushes me to learn new things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some new things today. So I'm going to be, there's some issues with comfort level with some of the topics, but there's some areas that we really can talk about. So food is something that we can all talk about, and we often do. As best I can tell, we eat a couple several times a day. It's something we like to do. It's something we take pleasure in doing. I know I enjoy waking up in the morning and my first thought is breakfast. And so food is something that is really close to our heart and really is in, in an evolutionary sense. It's part of you know, this fundamental selective triad of sex, food, and safety. And so if we can solve these problems of how we can eat, make babies, and not get eaten by other animals, what we can do is we can solve a lot of problems and we can explain a lot about the behaviors and anatomy of humans, our ancestors, and also all of, it, all of the animal world. So I'd like to begin at the beginning. And the beginning is we're primates. We're part of a radiation of mammals known as primates. We first became uh, the earliest evidence for primates is probably about 60 million years ago or so. And we now occupy a great part of the world, although primarily the tropics, not so much the, the temperate and certainly not the Arctic areas. And the primates have a diversity of behaviors and feeding, feeding ecologies that I think is essential for understanding a human's position in the world. The earliest primates, as I said, occur, are found about 60 million years ago. And their diet was that of an insectivore. They were uh, grudging around, grumbling around, getting the uh, small insects, worms, other very small uh, carnivory after a fashion. But by about 50 million years ago, primates made a transition that we became very strongly committed to being arboreal herbivores. In the sense that what we did is we moved up into the trees and we started eating leaves, fruits, also bark, pith, uh, resin from the trees. And so it's actually, it was the food that was up off the ground became a major source of primates beginning about 50 million years ago. Now, what we can see is humans, as you well know, are a group of great apes. We are great apes, although some people say we're wonderful apes. I think we're just great apes or, or large-bodied, tailless monkeys. And the, the large-bodied apes are the orangutans, which are on the top row, the gorillas in the middle row, and then we have the chimpanzees in the bottom row. And these are our closely related, closest related relatives. Chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor about seven to eight million years ago. Gorillas about nine to 12 million years ago. And so it's very informative to understand the biology and behaviors of these animals to explain humans. Of these, gorillas, the largest of these uh, animals in the middle row, what they do is they're most folivorous. They eat the lowest quality food. They spend their days eating leaves with a smattering of fruits and a diversity of other things. The orangutans on the top and the chimpanzees on the bottom are more frugivorous. They eat, they eat fruits. Now what's interesting is that the orangutans, which are very large bodied, very highly arboreal animals, tend to fill, fulfill a lot of their dietary net needs with low quality, unripe fruits. Now part of the reasons that they do this is ripe fruits are a vi highly prized uh, food resource and they're in some ways outcompeted by some of the other animals that are living in the jungles with them, such as siamangs and gibbons. The bottom row, the chimpanzees, the bonobo on the right and the common chimpanzee on the left, are the most fruit givers or fruit eating of all of uh, the great apes. And in fact, what they do is they, their dietary preference is in ripe fruit. Now there's another great ape that is, uh, uh, well known to all of us, uh, and, but humans are perhaps some of the most, uh, most distinctive among the primates in terms of our dietary choices. 
What we do is we are the most carniv carnivorous of all the primates. We have the greatest diversity of foods that we, we eat. We also do such things as prepare our food by breaking it up with knives and uh, chopping it and grinding it. We also cook our food. And so humans have done a lot of crazy things. And so what we'd like to do is talk about them for the next 45 minutes or so. Now, in order to be, continue our discussion of looking at the primates, the idea is we, we need to know what do primates do and how do we know what primates do. And so we can do a couple of different things. And first off, we can look at their, the field studies of the primates. And this just simply means that we go out and we study what the animals do. We go to where they're living. We watch them eat. We watch which part of the landscapes they occupy. We uh, collect their hair because we can do chemical analyses of the hair. We collect their feces because we can break these apart and figure out actually what they ate. Another thing that we can do, and this is more my research, is comparative anatomy. We can, fig we can say something about where an animal lives on the landscape and what it eats by what it looks like, what its locomotor anatomy is, how it moves around the earth, or uh, its landscape, how it, how it eats, what its digestive tract is like, how it processes the food by its dentition. And then other things that we can do is when we can do chemical analyses or isotopic analyses of the tissues of the animals themselves in case we can't sample the, observe what the animals do. We can sample their tissues, we can sample their hair, we can sample their fat, we can sample their muscles, their bones, and teeth. And so this is a technique that we can apply to figuring out what an animal ate, even after it's dead, and even using the fossil record, which is something that's very valuable for us as a paleoanthropologist. Now, chimpanzees, as we know, are large-bodied animals. They weigh, you know, 50, 60 uh, kilograms. They're large animals. They spend a lot of time in, the, time in the high canopy of the tree. And the reason that they do that is that's where the food is. And what's interesting about chimpanzees and the other animals is that not only do they have to shimmy up the tree in order to get to the food, they actually have to shimmy out and get to the edge of the branches, which is where all the fruits are, are located, which is where all the freshest leaves are located. So in order to be an arboreal animal, you have to find a way not only to get up into the trees, but you have to have a, find a way to get safely out to the end of the trees under the branches. And what this means is that there are a lot of adaptations that arboreal primates uh, exhibit. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can look at activity budgets. How an animal, a chimpanzee, spends its day. And these are a couple studies from Kibali in Uganda in which a group of researchers went out and tracked these animals and figured out how they spent their days. And their days are really broken down into two primary things, sleeping and eating. And as you can see from the, the data set up here, sleeping takes up about anywhere between a third of their time to almost 50% of their time. Not, not sleeping, but resting. And then when we talk about eating, eating takes up well over 40% of their day. The remainder of the time for these primates is that they're traveling. And where they're traveling is getting to the different resource areas. So that the lion's share of a chimpanzee's day is spent in the pursuit and the digestion of food. And this is very difficult for us to imagine because we can't imagine eating 45% of the time of the day. Could you imagine what we'd look like? It'd be, it'd be disturbing. So what is it the chimpanzees do? And this is just the common chimpanzees. And if we look at, at uh, there's a great range of uh, foods that they eat, but they really survive on ripe fruit. And we see that there's a range of variation between about 50% or 80% of their food food supply is made up of ripe, ripe food. But this is determined based on uh, time of year. It's also based on uh, the landscape that they occupy. But when they can't get ripe fruit, their preferred, their preferred food choice, they then go after and get unripe fruit. Now, you know that unripe fruit is unpreferred uh, preferred for you because you don't eat unripe apples. They're bitter, they're tart, they don't, they don't taste good. And also, they're not as digestively or uh, nutritively rich as is a ripe apple. Other things that they spend occupy their time with is eating leaves, buds, blossoms, other things that they can find in the trees, as well as nuts and seeds and pith and bark. And the seeds and nuts are very important for the chimpanzees because this provides a rich source of fat that are very difficult to get in a diet simply of plants, or, uh, leaves, and fruits. Now, there it leaves the other category of chimpanzees. And we've all seen the documentaries of chimpanzees termiting, eating termites, or eating driver ants, but that they also eat meat. Not very much, a couple percent of their, of their annual diet is uh, devoted to meat, but they do, in fact, eat meat. They'll actually hunt monkeys, and during some times of the year, they'll go on hunting parties almost daily. But it's important to look at other types of chimpanzees. Now, the chimpanzees we just looked at were forest chimps, and we look at here the Fongoli savanna chimps, 
These are chimpanzees that live in a more open environment in the Senegal. And what we find is that these chimpanzees is that they have a uh, diversity of habitats, savanna, woodland, and riverine. But what they do is they prefer to eat, get their food from the riverine resources. These are the tall trees by the river. So that means that they're eating free, uh, fruit and the highest quality of the foods available on their landscape. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can look at the diet or the dentition of animals to figure out what they eat. Now, it's very obvious what this animal eats. It eats meat, and if you saw this animal in this position, you'd be its dinner. And so we can infer that even animals with similar types of dentition, uh, a small cat has the same armamentarium as a lion, sharp dagger, canines, scissor-like uh, post-canine teeth so that they can break up and cut the meat. So we know that they eat meat. So what does a chimpanzee do? We know that chimpanzees also have can big canines. Well, this is a male chimpanzee. We know have big canines. Are they also using these teeth for eating meat? And the answer is, well, sometimes. Because chimpanzees, as we said, do eat meat. And here's a case where a party is sitting around engorging on a, a, uh, an animal that they've captured and are eating. What's interesting to note is that the meat that they're eating first is not this, the skeletal muscle, but it's actually eating their viscera. Because it's softest and it's easiest for them to process and digest. But as we can see, this is, a, this is a gelata baboon from the highlands of Ethiopia. And this animal weighs about 70, this male weighs about 70 to 100 pounds, yet it has the largest canine, a canine that's actually larger than a lion. And so you're thinking, well, this must be a really carnivorous type of animal. But in fact, the gelata baboon, when it's living up in the, the highlands of Ethiopia, is in fact a dedicated grass eater. It eats grass blades and seeds. And so that what we find is that this canine says nothing about dietary adaptations. It says more about how males are competing with other males so that they can compete for the only thing worth having, and that's reproductive access to females. So another thing that we can do is we can just, again, look at the anatomy. As we know, the chimpanzees are uh, boreally adapted animals. And the idea is you have to have the entire musculoskeletal system has to have adaptations to being an, uh, climbing into trees because you can't get a chance to fall out of a tree a second time. You just lose. So some, as we saw in the previous slide, the adaptation is shoulder, elbow, hip. But the thing that we focus on a lot is the adaptations of the hands and feet. And these are clearly adaptations to arboreality, to, to suspensory climbing in the hand, and also gripping in the feet. And, and apes have a grasping gray toe. When we compare this with humans, we can see that we are terrestrial. And so that limits the uh, spectrum or the range of resources that we can, uh, that we can examine. Uh, another thing that we can look at is, well, whenever I go to the zoo, this is a, zoo, a, a gorilla from our Cleveland Zoo, and I'm always surprised how big its stomach looks. And it's not because the gorilla is fat, it's just because gorillas have very, very big stomachs. And that's informative because we can talk about how the anatomy and the diet of these individuals link together. So let's do a quick review of the digestive system. We have the oral cavity at top, our mouths. We use this for mechanically processing our food and a little bit of digestive Enzymes are interjected at this point. Then passes down through the esophagus into the stomach where we get mechanical digestion, although we also get some enzymatic and acidic breakdown of the food sources. But then it passes to the most important part of the GI tract, and this is the small intestine. And the reason this is important, whereas this is where the lion's share of digestion occurs, and it's also where we get a lot of the absorption of these nutrients back into our body. So this is how stuff's getting back into our system so that we can actually take advantage of it. And then we have the large bowel, which is where we're actually absorbing water, and it's really processing uh, food to, get, to uh, evacuate this. And it's also, we're turning this into nutrients and vitamins. A comparison of some other GI tracts, I think, is also very useful, that the GI tract has different adaptations depending on your diet. In the upper uh, left-hand corner, you can see that this is a frugivorous type of GI tract. It's got a very long, small bowel in, in pink, and it's got a, a cecum, which is uh, useful for digesting uh, long carbohydrates, and it's got a, a reasonably short, large bowel. In the, upper, in the upper right corner, then we see an animal that eats a lot of leaves, or low-quality diet, and what they do is they've got a very short GI tract, or a short, small bowel, and a much longer, large bowel. So it really reflects what type of diet you have, and then if you're eating a lot of, of meat, or if you're a faunivore, what you're doing is your entire GI tract is uh, just shortened. And so if we can compare the GI tracts of 
of the apes. And the, we, what we do is we see that humans and the other apes have stomachs that are all about the same size, same proportion to the overall GI tract. But when we get down into the small bowel, we see that humans have a very long small bowel and humans have a very short uh, large intestine. And so again, what this does is this allows us to contrast the human gut system and use this as a datum so that we can then uh, try to assess what the dietary adaptations in human and our ancestors are. Do they eat uh, cadaver meat or uh, meat left over? Uh, what extent do uh, primates eat, uh, eat meat as far as uh, its spoilage uh, period? Okay. So the question is, so what type of, uh, how much meat do primates eat in general? The answer is very, very little. Uh, of the other primates that will eat meat, baboons will also on occasion eat meat, but it's very opportunistic as opposed to a planned hunt. If they stumble across an animal, they will eat it. But the thing we find is that when uh, chimpanzees kill an animal, the first thing they'll do is eviscerate it and eat the, eat the uh, internal organs, the viscera. We find that when chimpanzees begin eating the skeletal meat of these animals, they have a much more difficult time mechanically processing it. And they find that it takes many, many, many chew cycles in order to get this before the animal will swallow. And they'll find that some chimpanzees, what they will do is actually will modify uh, their chewing behavior by adding leaves. That they'll just reach leaves, whether they're dry leaves or fresh leaves, in there. And for some reason, it, I, I don't understand the mechanism, it changes the consistency of the meat so it allows it to be mechanically processed a little quicker. The thing you find is that an animal, when the meat becomes dried, if it's a day old or a couple of days old, what they will do is the meat becomes then very, very dry and very, very difficult for them to masticate. The other thing is that they can't take advantage of going after other resources like uh, bone marrow or things because they're not using tools in order to break open the bones a resource that other animals like hyenas, in fact, can do just by chewing on the bone. Have you had the opportunity to examine any of the animals that eat ge genetically modified foods to see if there are differences in their innards? The answer is no, I haven't. Uh, but, but the idea, I think it would be very, very useful to, to compare uh, the GI tracts of, uh, mo for example, like modern cattle and see if there have been any changes uh, versus a wild cattle. The, the difference could be is, uh, you, again, I don't know if there's enough time, but you could imagine that there are secular changes in gut length or gut proportions that may reflect diet. And some of the cattle that we're, uh, we're eating now have been eating on a very, very rarefied type of grain uh, diet for you know, a number of cow generations. And so we can see how, if there have been any changes in that. Uh, you could imagine you could do other animal, any type of domestic animal that eats a lot of, of food. I'm sp I suppose we could do this with dogs, our own house dog, you know, our own pets, to see what that, those changes are. What's the uh, takeaway on the, um, the chimp that had large canines but ate grass? I mean, it's be careful what, you, what conclusion you jump to or, or what? The, yes, the idea is that the, because, um, you know, when I look around, when I look at my dog and when I look at my cat, what I do is I look at, I see large canines. And to me, that immediately says that they're eating meat. And I don't come in contact with, with animals like, with primates that uh, have large canines but are not meat eaters. And so that what we have to do is we, because I know when all my students, when I show pictures of chimpanzees, the first thing they say, oh, they must eat a lot of meat and these canines are adaptations to eating those meat. But that's really not the case. What we do is we have, they have large canines I don't want to get off on a canine talk, but I, <laughs> I enjoy it, is the, the canine talk is that what happens is if you look at the canines in, in primates, what they do is that the upper canines rub against the lower premolars and effectively creates a knife in their mouth with the back part of the tooth is very, very sharp. Whereas if you look at a dog's tooth or a cat tooth, the back part of their tooth isn't that, is, they're pretty much round pegs, nails. And the reason is, is that the carnivores, when they're uh, collecting meat, what they do is they bite in an animal and they don't want the animal to get out. So it's like driving nails into the animal and it can't pull away. Whereas when you get a canine with a primate, what it does is it's, its teeth are knives and it goes in and bites and rips. And so what it wants to do is it wants to injure its opponent as opposed to hold on to it and, and um, kill it. Because what you want to do is you want to get in, it's like any knife fight, you want to get in and stab and get out. Because you don't want to, if you're holding on to a, if one male is holding on to another uh, male chimpanzee, he's going to fight back in a big way, and that's a, a, you're at risk. And again, females have very small canines, or much smaller canines in all these species, many of these species. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Scott Simpson discussing what chimpanzees eat. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, 
please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Simpson discusses the development of the human diet. Now, back to the talk. So now what I'd like to do is talk about human evolution and the events that are important to us. What are the big changes that have occurred in our lineage? And so the ones that I've, I've identified, and I think are pretty important, are the adoption of bipedality, which occurred anywhere between about four and a half to six million years ago. The adoption of carnivory. We started eating meat in a regular fashion at about 2.6 million years ago, and this was associated with stone tool manufacture. Fire was a very, very big behavioral change in humans. And what this did was allowed us a number of different ways to uh, eat food, prepare food. And then finally, uh, the, Neo well, the Neolithic Revolution, which is a big change occurred about 12,000 years ago that we're still paying a price for. And then we get the modern industrialization of food, which is, again, continuing to change the nature and types of food that we're eating. And it's affecting our health in a number of ways. So one of the things that we want to get back to is pretty much how do we reconstruct the diets of ancient ancestors? This is pretty much a restatement of what we saw the last time. Again, we can look at the comparative anatomy in our ancestors, locomotion, dentition, GI tract, again. We can look at stable isotopes. And again, this is evidence of what types of plants they were exploiting on the landscape, whether they're grasses or uh, leafy plants. And then we can go into archaeology. And this is effectively the field studies of the past. This is the easiest way in which we can get the behavior of past uh, human ancestors is by looking at actually what they did. It's like a time machine. So one of the earliest and best, well, and best known anatomical uh, hominins is Artipithecus rhamnus that lived in Ethiopia about 4.4, 4.5 million years ago. Artipithecus is a very extraordinary species because what it does is its anatomy tells us something about how it exploited and the landscape. If we look at its feet, it has a grasping foot, like a chimpanzee or gorilla, or certainly the medial side of the foot is got a grasping thumb. So that indicated it was capable of, of using it as to hold on for the branches as it was climbing. If we look at some of the hip musculature of the thigh, and of the thigh, what we can do is we can see that in some of the, chip, the musculature was like a chimpanzee, so that it was capable of, of some quadrupedal climbing up in the trees. However, mixed in with this is if we look at the lateral part of the foot, and we look at the upper part of the pelvis, and we look at the, the knee and the hip, that it also shows that, in fact, Artipithecus was becoming a biped. Now, when you're becoming a, a good biped is a bad arboreal And so what we see is that Artipithecus lacks the very, very long arms, lacks the very long fingers, lacks the stiff, stiff spine that we see in other arboreally adapted animals. So what we're seeing is this. Artipithecus, either by, by its adaptations, is now being limited to more arbor or terrestrial resources because it just can't get to the fruit that's at the tips of the branches up high in the canopy. Now, when we get to Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, by about 3.5 million years ago, 3.6 million years ago, we see that Lucy is a great biped, as good as we can, and we can stand on one leg just as well as I can. And that's really the hallmark of bipedality, is being able to stand on one leg. Her entire musculoskeletal system is now con, uh, committed to uh, bipedal striding gait, which means that she's limited to uh, terrestrial environments. And we know that she was a good biped because we can see on the left side here, these are the Lytoli footprints that are actually impressions in the volcanic tuff three points from 3.6 million years ago, which indicates that they were walking bipedally, as were we. Now, Australopithecus afarensis was undoubtedly climbing trees and getting resources and maybe using that for uh, nesting at night. But it wasn't as good a, an arboreal as a chimpanzee. In fact, if Lucy, or if Lucy was climbing the trees, she would climb the trees in pretty much the same way we would and with the same success. So let's move over to looking at the ice, uh, carbon isotopes. Now, carbon isotopes, are they tell us about whether we're eating tropical grasses or whether we're eating leafy browse. And if on the vertical scale, what we can see is we can, we can uh, measure based on the tissues of the uh, individuals, in this case we're looking at the enamel, whether they have a, a grass uh, signal or a C4 signal so that they'd be towards the top part of the slide, or whether they've got a browse signal or being towards the bottom part of the slide. Also what we have here is that we've got a time range. So we're looking at the evolution of humans or human ancestors from four and a half million years, years ago until about one million years ago. And we see in not the homo branch, not the group that led to us, but the other Australopithecines and paraanthropines what they did was as 
over time, they became increasingly adapted to grass. And we should be able to see that both in their behavior and their anatomy. And one of the things we can do is we can look at these, this C3, C4 signal, and then we can also look at how big their teeth are. And on the vertical scale, again, is how much grass or how much browse they eat. Grass is up, browse is down. And then how big their teeth are. And what we're doing is we're measuring their, their grinding teeth, their post-canine teeth, their premolars and molars. And so bigger's to the right and smaller's to the left. And if we see Paranthropus boisei has very, very large teeth, but is also eating a lot of grass based on isotopic analyses. So this is Paranthropus boisei, or Australopithecus boisei, or some of you may know as Zinjanthropus. Uh, but we see here that this is, uh, looking at the palate on the right, this individual has very, very big post canine teeth. The premolars and molars are very large, quite big. And the anterior teeth are quite small. And the facial architecture shows that they did have some special masticatory adaptations. They're very big chewing muscles of the masseter. The temporalis muscles on the side of their head were so large that they grew towards the midline and actually formed a bony crest down the ridge of the, ridge of the skull. So this was a, an incredible specialization. Now, if we compare this with a chimpanzee, and the chimpanzees on the left, and what I've done is I've normalized the two palates to about the same length. And what we can do is you can immediately see the difference between the size of the molar teeth and the premolar teeth, and the incredible enlargement of the post canine teeth in the Paranthropus boisei. The other thing we can notice is that their anterior teeth, their incisors, are much reduced in Paranthropus, and they're in fact enlarged in chimpanzees, because this has to do with the way in which chimpanzees prepare their food, including ripping the skins off of fruit and also stripping food. So we can see that there are a number of adaptations of dietary uh, reflected adaptations just by looking at the dentition of these individuals. Another thing we can do is look at tool behavior. A number of animals use tools. There's the raven or the crows. They're using tools in order to, to pull out larvae, using small twigs to pull out larvae there in the rotting wood. Then we see the, the sea otter, which is using rocks in order to break open the shells. And then we see the cebus monkeys and the chimpanzees, which are using stone tools to break open uh, break open rock or break open nuts. And the unifying theme is that all these animals are using tools in order to get food. So what they've done is they, they can't do this with their own anatomy, so that what they have to do is they have to develop new behaviors using new means in order to gain access to valuable resources. And the nuts are, and these larvae are very rich sources of fats that you don't normally get in a, uh, or easy to get in a vegetarian only diet. So looking at the stone tools, that we have here. On the, this is an Oldowan stone tool. These are the earliest stone tools made, come from Ethiopia. The bottom is a chopping tool. This is just a, a river cobble where a couple of flakes have been taken off around the periphery so you get something of a sharp edge and a point, but it's still just a river cobble. And then on the top are the flakes that they've actually knocked off a core like this. And so the question we face is, now who's making these guys? Well, we really don't know because we haven't found the skeleton with the stone tool in its hand. But the two candidates are the only two species that we know, well, are, are known from this time period that are suspected, are Australopithecus gari, which probably didn't, and Homo habilis. And so Homo habilis, if, if it is the stone tool maker, then it shows that stone tool manufacture is at the very origins of our genus Homo. So the question becomes, is what are they using these stone tools for? Here's a specimen we recovered in Ethiopia. It's dated two and a half million years ago. This is the inside of, we're looking at the inside of a, a, a antelope's left mandible. And you see this, the, in the various insets, we see a series of scratches. And on the lower right hand, we see an inset taken by scanning electron microscope of these scratches. And what they do is they bear the, the diagnostic signature of a stone tool scratch. And we can distinguish this from carnivore gnawing marks based on a series of, repetitive, of replicative studies. And so what we're doing is, two and a half million years ago, an individual is using a flake tool in order to cut the muscle off the inside of the mandible, which are the, the tongue muscles, some of the chewing muscles, and going after these uh, valued tidbits. Here's another bone that we found uh, very close by. And this is the tibia bone, or shank bone, of another type of bovid. And what, we find, what you can see on here is that this has been battered and cut. Uh, I don't have a, a slide, or. A, a uh, laser pointer, but these vertical lines that you can see on the, uh, on the bone are actually cut marks using a stone tool. But the more important thing is if you see these round oval depressions up there, those are percussion marks where someone took a stone tool, a stone cobble, and battered, 
battered the bone. And the reason they did this is if you can see on the top slide, the right hand or the distal part of the bone, it's a fresh break. So they broke the bone open to get marrow. Marrow is very rich in fat, and also it's very easy to digest so we don't, and chew, so we don't have to have that, that meat problem that chimpanzees had. Problem though with meat eating is you're going against some pretty heavy hitters out there. People, er, people, animals that are very, very well adapted to eating meat. Lions, hyenas, cheetahs, there are other extinct animal, large body carnivores that aren't out there now. And what's very interesting is the two biggest carnivores in Africa today are the lion and the hyena. And many times they'll compete for the same kill. The consequence of that is that that is a primary source of mortality in hyenas and lions. They're killing each other at these, at these kill sites. The other thing is it opens the door for cannibalism, because then you're starting to look at your next door neighbor as food. Another thing we get is diseases from, that we get from eating these meats are, are a variety of things that we haven't had before. So we're getting salmonella, we're getting campylobacter. And so that these are things that can compromise our health that weren't a major concern when we were herbivores. But the big, the take home point of this is we do it because it works. What we find is eating meat and eat, eating animal proteins and fats is a very, very good source of those, of those uh, nutrient components. And so they're very efficient things. And so what we find is that animals that are on richer diets, they tend to come into uh, reproductive age at a, younger, at a younger age. And so that means you can have a demographic change in here. So what you can do is you can short your generation length. So as you can see the adaptive significance of eating meat, despite all the other consequences are there. Now in terms of talking about cannibalism, we can have, oh, thank you. In, in cannibalism here is that Bodo is a, a, a human ancestor. It's about 600,000 years old. And it has the largest face of any human ancestor we've ever found. It's just a massive person. But very, if you look very carefully under the line that used to be moving, there's some cut marks in there. So the idea was, Here's Bodo, actually someone came along soon after he died and cut his flesh off. Now we don't know whether this is ceremonial in a long, large sense or whether it's behavioral or whether it's they're actually choosing, using this as a meat eating opportunity. So we, it's still unconsequential, you know, uncertain whether this is a cannibalism. However, when we go and look at Neanderthals, and this is a cave in France called Moula Gersi, and it's about 100 to 120,000 years ago, the, the cave has a number of bones in there, animal bones and human bones. And what's very interesting is when you look at the frequency of cut marks on the deer bone and the human bones, or Neanderthal bones, and you also look at the way the bones are broken, what they're doing is these Neanderthals were processing the other Neanderthals and the deer in the same way. They're breaking them open for marrow. The cut marks are there to reduce, uh, to uh, remove the f uh, flesh. So the issue becomes is, it, are Neanderthals actually cannibals? And in fact, that there are a number of Neanderthal sites in Europe that show evidence of this cannibalism. Now, whether it's ritual cannibalism or whether it's a cannibalism out of need, we don't know. But we will know once we get into the time machine. Uh, last then, we, we can talk about fire, too. And fire is something that we, can't, that, uh, we first see evidence of about a million years ago. First controlled use of fire is about 350,000 years ago. We, we know this from we see, find a series of hearths. But the one thing is it's universal among human groups. Every human group uses fire. It's absolutely necessary to the way we process food. Because when we use it to, for processing food, what it does is it detoxifies food. It improves the consistency of food. For example, try eating an uncooked potato. And then it also enhances the dietary quality. So at fire provides, improves the food that we're already eating. And then other uses, of course, warmth, light, and protection. Now, let's get back to our big gorilla here with a big gut. Now, again, he's not fat. He just has a big gut. Now, what we can do is we can measure gut size relative to, to body size. And this is each of these dots. The lower line is for colon and cecum. That's part of the uh, large bowel. And the top part is for uh, total gut volume. And we see that among primates, these are for apes, that it's pretty consistent. The odd individual out are humans. We have small guts. That's why we don't have a big bulbous belly as we see in the other apes. Because what we do is we've reduced our gut. The implications of this is what we can do is we can get the same amount of nutrition more efficiently into our body with a smaller gut. So the question becomes is when, when did this actually occur? Well, we can look at the pelvis. Lucy at 3.2 million years ago has a very big lateral flaring pelvis. 
A lot of that adaptation is for locomotion. Now I'm arm waving here. But part of that could also be the fact that she had a very, very large gut. And so you need this flaring ilium in order to enlarge the gut. Humans, because it's more vertical, we have a smaller gut, we need less space. And so we don't have the lateral flaring of the ilia. So here is a pelvis from a million years ago, 1.2 million years ago, that also has lateral flaring. So what is probably suggest that, yes, it was a full biped like we are. It had obstetric capacity that was very, very good. But it also probably had a large bowel as well. So it didn't have those mechanisms that we see, uh, those bowel reducing mechanisms that we see in modern humans. Some of the primates that you showed earlier had very large appendices. What do you feel the purpose of the appendix was? The appendix is um, not all primates do have very large appendices. What we find now is that the appendix in human is, 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 some people say it doesn't do anything, but actually it's filled with lymphoid tissue. So it's involved in the, uh, the immune system in a, a general way. That the, the appendix is thought to be a part of the shrinking of the cecum in the animal. So animals that have very large ceca tend not to have appendices. So as you reduce your, reduce your cecum, what you want to do is you want to maintain a little bit of its capacity for having a, uh, for having a digestive component in the tract, but you also want to maintain its lymphoid component. So the, uh, why these animals have, have appendices is probably it has to do that we need to maintain those types of tissues for, uh, for uh, maintenance of our lymph system and our immune system. But, and so we don't want to lose those because they become immunologically compromised. Why they differ in length, I just, I don't know. Okay, you showed that um, the Neanderthals were, had cut marks on the bones. Was there any time that um, you thought it might be modern Cro-Magnon man that was cutting on the Neanderthals? Has any, any evidence been found of that? Well, th that's, this is an easy one, especially because what we find is that we didn't see modern, uh, modern humans come into this part of, of uh, Europe until about 40, 45,000 years ago. And so this site at Mulagersi is over 100,000 years old. So that the only other uh, individuals out there on the landscape are Neanderthals. The other thing is what you can find is that the teeth and the crania are very diagnostic of Neanderthals and that the, we find unprocessed Neanderthals and we find processed Neanderthals. And so the idea is that the processed Neanderthals were the food and that the unprocessed Neanderthals were the individuals who were living there and, and inhabited that cave. And so what we find is we've got a good match that all of the players in this game were of Neanderthal ancestry. Been oh, so, has there been, so is there any evidence of uh, modern humans eating Neanderthals? The answer is the, uh, that would be very, very difficult information to get simply because the modern humans spread out through Europe so very, very quickly that there wouldn't be enough time to, uh, uh, there didn't seem to be enough overlap time. And then also you'd have to again find very, very specific information of the killer and the killee. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Scott Simpson. Dr. Simpson is Project Paleoanthropologist on the Gona Research Project in Afar, Ethiopia. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the development of the human diet. In our final segment, Dr. Simpson will look at how the modern diet diverges from our traditional one. Now, back to our talk. So now we're going to jump forward into the Neolithic Revolution. And so we're coming up to about, oh, uh, the transition between foraging and uh, agriculture, and this is actually very recent in our origin, in our history, so running about between 10 to 13,000 years ago. And so this is areas where we find a lot of plant and animal domestication, and that there are a number of centers of domestication throughout the world. So it wasn't that there was one domestication center that then radiated out. It seemed that there was humans, and at this point we're finally talking about humans, were now finally starting to manipulate their environments in parallel ways. The interesting thing we find is that this then leads to what we refer to as the Neolithic Revolution, where we're starting to see a gradual increase in population size. We're starting to see the rise of dense habitation zones, a rise of sedentarism. And I, what I mean by that is not we're sitting on our bums, but that we're, fit, we're living in villages that are continuous over long periods of time. And then we're also, this allows us for social stratification. If you have a lot of people living in a single spot, then you can change the, uh, become increasingly culturally complex. People can take on different activities and different behaviors. And so this, the, 
this uh, revolution is absolutely a necessary part of the foundation relating to urbanism in uh, modern, modern uh, activities. And so here's just a map of some of the plant domestication areas. We can see up here in the uh, United States there is Kenopodium that was uh, 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 domesticated. We also get squash, then down in Mesoamerica we get the corn and the beans. We also get turkeys down in Mesoamerica, then we get in South America, we get the alpacas and llamas, then we also get potatoes. Uh, in sub er, Saharan Africa, cattle, goats, sheep, then we're getting the fertile crescent, we know then the familiar ones with barley and wheat. Up in Ethiopia, coffee. Tej, which is a, used for a, um, making bread, making flour. We also get a domestication of rice in Asia. So we can see these are all occurring on very different types of plants, but in about the same time period, which is just extraordinary. And here's a list of the sequence of timing of when we get the different animals are domesticated. And we see that first we have the dog and sheep and cat. And the dog was domesticated probably in a number of different places uh, across a span of time. But we can then identify sheep and goats and other things and domesticated animals as late as the turkey about a couple of thousand years ago. The main uh, similarity between a lot of these animals is that they're food animals. We're either eating their meat, drinking their milk, eating their eggs. And then the animals that we aren't eating or exploiting in that way is what we're doing we're perhaps using as draft animals in service of these agricultural activities. So what we're finding is domestication is either we're using this as a food resource or as a mechanism to improve our capacity to uh, grow food. But this comes at a cost. And what we find is that animals have diseases. And when these animals have diseases, humans are susceptible to some of them, especially when we're in contact for a long period of time. So now we're getting exposed to diseases we didn't have before. Tuberculosis, the swine flu, the avian flu, uh, measles, uh, trichinosis. So these are things that are a consequence of our meat eating that it's occurring in a, a very formal and dense uh, relationship with these domesticated animals. So everything wasn't hunky-dory with domestication. What I'd like to do is provide a, an example of the transition between hunter and gatherer and agriculture that I'm most familiar with in the coast of Georgia. And if you can look on, on the um, uh, the map here, these are the Barrier Islands, St. Catharines, Blackbeard Islands, St. Simons and such. And that there are uh, Native Americans were living, have been living on these islands for many thousands of years. And my colleague Clark Larson at Ohio State did his research on the skeletal biology of these individuals and uh, came to some interesting observations. First off, it was the, before about 1150 AD, the Native Americans were primarily hunters and gatherers. They were eating deer, they were, because they were right there on the barrier coast on the intercoastal waterway, they're eating a lot of, of uh, uh, shells and fish. And, but they also had some corn in the area. But then about beginning about 1150, what we find is that agriculture really took off and it became very concentrated agriculture. And what we do is we notice this because the village sizes are becoming larger. They're starting to become palisaded, meaning they've got walls. Um, we're starting to find uh, just more evidence of people on the landscape in coastal Georgia. But this really comes at a cost of sanitation problems and density dependent diseases. But one of the things we can talk about that is directly related to diet, certainly in the Georgia coast, is that their focus of, on food of corn led to a tremendous increase in dental caries, cavities. And if we look at the individuals in blue, these are the pre-agriculture, and we can see that the caries frequency is quite low. But then after uh, agriculture took over and became the primary economic resource uh, mechanism, what we find is that about 60% of the population then had carious lesions. And so this, as you well know, this creates compromises our health uh, and can in fact kill us. And the reason that this happens is that corn is sugar. It's sugar, sugar rich. And we know this because we're eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup uh, today. Other problems we find is that there's iron deficient anemia in here. And this leads to characteristic lesions on the skull. The iron deficient anemia, the reason we find this in corn dependent uh, populations is that co uh, corn is uh, deficient in iron and it also, uh, it's eating a corn diet inhibits the uptake of iron. So then we get anemic, chronic anemic conditions. Other issues that we face are periosteal reactions. These are infections of the bone. 
This isn't directly related to food, but what it is is directly related to the high population densities that were allowed by having a stable food source in here. So that means as we, we came in contact with one another, lived in close confines, we became sicker. Then we can also look at the, our lifespans in these time periods. In the pre-agriculture uh, period, we have a, uh, a survivorship curve that looks something like this. And then when we compare this with the agricultural individuals, we find they had a, a shorter lifespan and they had higher uh, mortality. Now the higher mortality occurred mostly in the teens and 20s. So this is probably as a result of uh, aggression as opposed to some, some type of disease because this is normally when individuals are healthy. But again, it shows the the pressures that increased food base has on producing high density populations and how this impacts our behavior. Okay, uh, so what we'd like to do is look at the cause of death in, in 1900 in the United States. And so that there are a number, this is the top 10 from the records and we can see in the areas that are highlighted in the arrows, these are diet related diseases. These are diseases of lifestyle. And so what we're finding is the heart disease in here, stroke, nephropathies, this is problems with the kidneys, and also some forms of cancer are associated with diet. Now if we compare this, if we compare this with the deaths from uh, top 10 deaths in uh, 2011, what we can see now is the lifestyle diseases, the heart disease, the cancer, the stroke, diabetes, nephropathies, these are a greater component of the mortality profile of modern Americans, and many of these are related to the types of foods we eat as well as our activity, of our activity levels. So the question then becomes, is there a mismatch between our phys physiology and our diet? Is there something we have to do in order to change our diet? And because what we're finding is that our diet that we have uniquely, pre or, uh, uh, we're now at risk of these diseases that we don't find in non-Western er, populations. Again, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes. These are very familiar to us, and some of us even have these pro health problems. Like obesity is not only a United States problem, it is a worldwide problem. What we can see is over the past 30 years or 40 years has been a tremendous increase in the amount of obesity, not only in the United States, but across the world. I find it remarkable that in 1970, uh, 73, 14% of Americans were characterized as obese or having a BMI of over 30. Now it's one third of Americans. And this has to do with our lifestyle and the types of foods that we're eating. If we look at diabetes and the rate of diabetes in the past 40 years, or actually 50 years, is we can see that 1% of Americans had uh, type 2 diabetes uh, in late 50s. And now what we're doing, it's 6% of Americans have diabetes. And this is, these are clearly lifestyle types of issues based on the types of food that we're eating and again on our activity levels. If we look at the amount of food that we're seeing, we can see that now we're eating much more food than we did even 50 years ago. When we were children, I was a child, it was, you guys weren't even born yet. So the, but uh, you know, 40 years ago, what we're doing is we're now eating 20% more food, taking in 20% more calories than we did. And so again, this is the types of foods that we're eating and the accessibility of food. Sugar is something, everybody loves sugar. And what we'll find is that whenever we get a chance to eat sugar, we do. And so beginning in the 1850s, we started increasing the supply of sugar, first by growing sugar cane, now it's by corn and the high fructose corn syrup that we have in there, and we add it to everything. We're now eating, on average, 70 kilos of sugar per year per person. That's a lot of sugar. That's almost a half pound of sugar per day. Watch what we eat, huh? <laughs> now we can see associated with this, now it's, this is a, a, quarter, or not quarter of, but it's a co occurring effect is we get this obesity. We have to say that yes, obesity is occurring, but not strictly associated with sugar, but it is associated with our total caloric uh, intake and where we're getting our energy from, whether it's fats, sugars, or versus proteins. Another thing that affects what we do is where we eat, which is very interesting. Until quite recently, quite recently in human history, we ate at home. There was no opportunity to go to restaurants. Neanderthals didn't go to restaurants because they didn't have restaurants. <laughs> they ate around the hearth and they chit-chatted with each other. But what we're finding now is that not only are we going, spending more time going out to eat, we're going spending more time to go out to eat in fast food restaurants. And we know that 
from the history of fast food restaurants, they're large portions, they're filled with um, uh, fats and sugars and the types of things that aren't, don't create a balanced diet. Even when we go out to uh, restaurants, restaurants, even fancy schmancy restaurants, we're finding we can't control the food quality there and even there we're finding we're getting too much salt in, salt in our diet. So we always have to be careful about what we eat. So here is a list that was created by uh, Cordain. Cordain is the, the man, he's the, uh, uh, the most vocal proponent of the paleo diet, if you've heard of the paleo diet. And what he's done is he's created a list of the types of foods that we eat today and how much energy we, we get from this food. And the reason he brought these foods out is, is because these are foods that he thinks are new to our diets. And when he means new to our diets, new in the past 10 to 15,000 years. And so we wouldn't see this in you know, uh, someone from 20,000 years ago. And these include milks and cheese because we didn't have access to, we didn't have access to sheep and goats and uh, horse, uh, cattle and horses. Uh, the refined grains, certainly that we weren't processing grains because we really even didn't have access to grains because they hadn't been domesticated yet. Sure, we were eating some of their ancestral grains, but they didn't make up a major part of our diet. Certainly the refined sugars make up a big part of this. HF uh, CS is um, high fructose corn syrup. And we can see that we get about 8%, 7.8% of our daily energy from these foods. And so the idea is that we have all of these foods that are new to the human body, but we've been living, as we pointed out, for six million years as, as uh, hominins. And so have all of these changes that have occurred within the past 10,000 years, or the past 200 years, created a new dietary spectrum that no longer is, works with our existing physiology. And some say yes, some say no, and, but some people who don't like, you know, the Paleolithic guys, I'm sure that they would like a, uh, they would like a, some high fructose corn syrup every now and then. Because what we've done is we paid, there, we've had a series of trade-offs between accessibility to food and then overindulgence in the food. The other thing we have, we have a, an issue with uh, activity levels. And activity levels have dropped substantially within the past 40 or 50 years. And so it's not that the, necessarily the types of food are mismatched with our physiology. What it is is that there are choices about the foods that we're making that are a mismatch with our physiology. And what we can do is we can go to the supermarket and we can order all the foods that we need that will keep us, keep us healthy. And we don't necessarily, we're not on a fast train to type 2 diabetes or uh, hypertension or deterioration of our kidneys. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins. The Institute is a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. The Fall 2014 Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.